In the woods, you'll find all kinds of horrifying stories. From cryptid encounters to strange people who call the woods home, you'll never know what we'll find. Today's viewers sent in their stories to swampdweller.net. They also sent these in via r slash the dark swamp on reddit, and you can send in yours at those places as well. Today's stories will definitely freak you out, and they are allegedly true, so take them with a grain of salt. If you're new to the swamp, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications as I upload new episodes nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. You know, after a long day of being the apex predator in the swamps where I live, aka Florida manning everywhere, it definitely does give me anxiety knowing that all the local gators have it out for me. They're just jealous of my great new snake boots, and they're just mad that they can't make snake boots with their small little arms. And the anxiety this has given me has definitely altered my daily routine. But that was until I found microdose gummies. Microdose gummies give me clarity in my life when I need it most. When my anxiety paints the sky gray and everything feels like it's gonna be doom and gloom, just one third of a microdose gummy, and that helps me take the day as it comes without spinning off into weird places in my head. You know, we all have anxiety, we all have stress, and we all deserve to relieve that stress in healthy ways. I personally love microdose gummies, it's helped me with my workout and recovery, my creativity, and my anxiety, and I recommend that you try it as well. So, what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp today. Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code SWAMP to get free shipping and 30% off your order. Links can be found in the show description, but again, that's microdose.com and use code SWAMP. Creepy Hiking Experience at Mount Pisgah by Chaos Kayla. This happened at the beautiful rural spot of Mount Pisgah slash Lake Willoughby, Vermont. Now, Willoughby and this area have a lot of lore and Indian history. One legend is of an enormous cave somewhere at the bottom of the Lake Willoughby area, which is deep, dark, and massive. It is believed somewhere at the bottom of this lake there is an underground tunnel that runs from multiple caves that lead to different lakes in the area, yet no one knows what's living in said cave. For some reason, this lore spooks me quite a bit, probably because I have the lassophobia, yet I love swimming. Strange things happen a lot out here, because there's also a ley line called the Crown Chakra that runs straight through the lake. Whenever I visit this place, I feel something... something strange. Nature is beautiful, yet the spirits and everything else tells you they are there. I wouldn't be surprised if those mountains had hidden cave systems. Anyway, lots of strange, spooky things happen at Lake Willoughby. Now, on to my story. In May of 2016, I was hanging out with my aunt, I call her auntie, for the day, and we were just relaxing at her house and cleaning. After some time, she asked if I wanted to go on a hike to get out of the area. I agreed since it was a beautiful day. It was clear outside and not too hot or cold. I loved hiking. We packed our bags and drinks and snacks and hopped into the car. Upon getting into the car, I realized my aunt had grabbed her 9mm while we were preparing. She was examining the gun as I watched. I can't remember what kind of 9mm it was, but it luckily had a safety because she double-checked it was on. She caught my gaze. You're not worried about me taking this with us, are you? I shook my head since it was bear and cougar territory out there. I knew it was for scaring something off like that, if anything would happen. Our goal would be to scare things, obviously, and not to harm anything unless absolutely needed. We're both animal lovers, and would not want to shoot at anything or anyone without having to. We gassed up and took off. When we got there, we chose the south side of the lake, this was my personal favorite side to hike. We began to trek up Mount Pisgah, taking in the beautiful scenery and peace surrounding us. Our stress of being surrounded by society was quickly washed away. We enjoyed ourselves a lot climbing up the mountain until we reached the first lookout point. It's a large rock poking out on the mountainside, looking over the lake. You can see absolutely everything there. 
you're pretty high up, honestly. I'm not sure how high up, but high up enough that if you fall, you're a goner. I sat on the lookout, taking in the scenery as Auntie was taking pictures on her phone of me and the area. After a couple of minutes, we turned around to continue, but stopped when we saw a dog standing quietly in the middle of the trail by themselves, panting and watching us calmly. They startled us a little bit, and we wondered where they came from since it had a pack strapped to its back. We didn't hear them coming, and they were so quiet, but soon we heard a voice close by say, Hello! We both looked where it came from and saw an older gentleman waving and smiling at us. We returned the greeting, and he told us how much his pup loved scratches and pats. So I played with her for a couple of minutes, and Auntie started a conversation. Just to warn you young ladies, my girl and I came from the other side of the mountain, and during our walk we heard something in the foliage. So she went after it. The man gestured to his dog. Out came a black bear. She chased them away till I couldn't see where they went. I'm not sure if they came over here. We thanked him for the warning and Auntie showed him the gun that we had. He nodded in approval, and we were all ready to move on. He gave his pup the okay when she looked up at him, and that was that. We were more alert to our surroundings for the rest of this hike, and Auntie took the lead. We wouldn't let this scare us away, though. We had protection and should be okay. Suddenly, we heard rustling from behind a tree ahead of us. Auntie immediately stopped in her tracks with a hand on the holster as we both stared at where it was coming from. Then, a red squirrel hopped into view. Auntie relaxed and let go of the holster while I touched her shoulder. Be careful. They can smell fear. I warned. She gave me an unimpressed look while I laughed, and the squirrel ran off. We started walking again. The more we climbed, the more our surroundings opened up, where we could see through the trees quickly. It started to be replaced with ditches in the ground, ledges above us, and lots of boulders and more giant trees. Now anything could easily hide itself. When we passed through this first spot of new scenery, we stopped to take a snack and water break. We recharged quietly with some small talk listening to the birds and other animals singing their songs and talking out further in the woods. But then, we heard something much louder a louder rustling sound coming from our left. It didn't sound too close at first, but not too far away either. It didn't grab our attention, but we did notice it very slightly. As it continued, we stared in the direction it was coming from. I guessed it could be squirrels playing, although it did sound a bit too big, so Auntie thought it might be a deer. And then, as quickly as it started, it just stopped. So we packed up and kept going after that. We didn't hear anything else, but that kept us alert. Although I tried to focus on the hike to keep enjoying it, we talked about anything for a little bit of noise and to give whatever could be ahead of us a heads up so we could give each other space. However, as we kept going, we eventually heard a stick snap from somewhere far behind us and off to the side, and then more rustling. It was softer this time, but it was there. We looked in its direction, but as before, we couldn't see what it was. Now at this point we were far up the mountain and hadn't seen any other hikers since the man and his dog, so we were alone with whatever it was. For the rest of the trip it was an on and off again thing. Never too close, never too far, and we could never see what it was, so you can imagine how on edge we were. Finally though it stopped entirely. We picked up our pace to keep the distance between us and whatever was, whatever this thing was especially with the surroundings getting thicker despite the steep climb. Since we had last heard it, it was quite some time, so we thought maybe it stopped and lost interest. But then, as we came to another quick pause on a more even part of the trail, I realized there was no sound at all. No chirps from the birds, no chatters from the squirrels, nothing at all. The forest was suddenly so silent when it was full of noise before. I was focused on keeping our distance from our stalker that I didn't notice the eerie silence until this point. When did all the animals go quiet? I wondered. My anxiousness grew as I raised an index finger and was about to say something about this disturbing silence, but I stopped when I saw Auntie noticed it too. She instructed me to make more noise as she turned some music on her phone, still hoping we could scare off whatever was around, but not be too loud that we couldn't hear it. She led the way as I clapped, and I was singing some lyrics from a song I liked from a band called Avenged Sevenfold. 
Some minutes later, Auntie grew more rigid than ever before. I bumped into her in an accident, not paying attention, cutting off my ridiculousness as she turned off her phone. She told me to stay quiet, stay close, and she pulled out her gun for the first time. The rustling returned, and this time it was right in front of us. We both stared into the now thick forest, trying to see through it, but it was impossible. This time, the rustling was slow with creaking, snapping branches. A along with that, we could hear the rustles turning into footfall as well. Whatever our stalker was, it was now creeping toward us, and it was bipedal. We both started to pick up rocks and threw them in its direction, shouting for it to leave us alone. But as you can guess, this didn't work. The footsteps kept coming at that same slow pace, even while we were throwing rocks at it. I tucked myself behind and between my auntie in a tree. She held the gun up and called out to be sure. If this is a person, I have a weapon, so say something if you are human. There was no answer. It was just more rustling. My auntie repeats herself one last time, and we get nothing, just cracking branches. Hey, hey! Auntie shouts for the third time, and again for the third time, no answer. They were getting louder, so she quickly raised the gun, checked to see if there were any birds or small animals in the branches that could be in the way, and fired a warning shot. The ringing in my ears faded eventually, and I was met with silence. There weren't any more footsteps. Nothing was making noise now. It was as if the wind had gone quiet because of what was happening. But that didn't last long, because why would it? And this still makes me nervous today when I think about it. Some long seconds later, the footsteps slowly began again, and that scared me. The hair on the back of our necks rose, and at this point, we finally decided it was time that we had to go. We tried not to run, but the weight of our packs and the steep slope made us move faster than we wanted to while trying to keep our pace. We were in quite the pinch, but whatever was following us, it didn't care. It continued to come for us, moving through the woods with purpose. We both frantically looked around to see if we could catch a glimpse of it, but to no avail. It sounded fast, so darn fast, and it kept itself hidden the entire time. This went on for a horrific amount of time, until we finally reached the more open part of the trail. There we could see much easier into the woods. So now, with Auntie already able to control and slow down her pace, I was still trying to figure out my footing, and I slammed into her on accident, but this would actually help us in the long run. She was looking at something on the ground. Frightened, I demanded to know what she was looking at, noting that the noises behind us had stopped again. Auntie pointed into the dirt. Look, there were claw marks in the middle of the trail. Long claw marks scratched up in the earth. There was something strange and wet about them. I didn't take a picture, we were too busy trying to escape, but I think I knew what it was. It was dark in color, and I had to assume it was blood. I don't know if it was human blood, from some sort of animal, or what, but we resumed our light jog immediately. We didn't dare look behind us or stay for around too long. If this was a bear, a mountain lion, something that had just killed something, we did not want to be around to find out. From there, we made our guesses from what it could be. I guessed it was a bear. However, it sounded too swift. Bears are fast, but this was a different kind of fast. It just didn't feel like it was a bear. My auntie thought it was a cougar, which it could very well be. However, this thought was almost wholly swept off the table when a very loud, unsettling noise came from the distance behind us. It was horrible, insanely loud, and it's something that I can't even describe. It was like a high-pitched roar or bellow. It sounded like something that would come straight out of hell. We both jumped, ran as fast as we could to the parking lot, got into our car, and felt just slightly a bit safer. Once we jumped in the car, we clamored to get our bags thrown in the back. We were pretty well shaken, and when we drove off, we couldn't stop but feeling this adrenaline coursing through our body, leaving us looking like crackheads. We stared at the road, and we noticed that there was nothing out there. Luckily, nothing followed us. We dropped ourselves onto our bed and couch when we got home, and we just knocked out. To this day, pushing seven years later, we still don't know what the heck made that scream and what was what was hunting us. We don't know if it was a cougar, a bear, a bobcat, or something else, but whatever it was, it's one of the most terrifying moments in my entire life. I like to share this story because it's pretty thrilling, but it might have been an animal. Knowing how much Indian history has bled into Lake Willoughby, it could very well be something to do with the legends of the ley line. It could be some sort of cryptid some sort of paranormal thing. 
I still love going to that area, don't get me wrong. But I have a whole new respect for it. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I found your channel after your 10 scary and strange park ranger horror stories video appeared on my YouTube homepage. And I noticed you cover a lot of missing persons and missing 411 style cases. It's quite difficult for me to talk about, so excuse me if my retelling is less than stellar, but I think you might be interested in what happened to my brother, Jacob. Outside of a few initial news reports back in the early 90s, it's not one of those heavily featured cases in the media, so I don't think your viewers will have heard much about it. Now, having gotten my little disclaimer out of the way, I'll get on with it. Every 4th of July when I was a kid, my dad would drive me, my uncle Ralph, and my little brother out to a place called Big Bear Lake in my native California. Big Bear is a beautiful snow-fed reservoir, set into the hills about 30 miles outside of San Bernardino. Given how pretty it is up there, it's only natural that the South Shore is teeming with cozy, cookie-cutter log cabins, and little marinas offering water skiing lessons. The hills around Big Bear are also home to a number of relatively flat, tree-ringed meadows that are designated as campgrounds. And it's at one of those that we'd pitch our tent come Independence Day before firing up the grill, mingling with other campers, and watching the fireworks with awe and wonder as the sun came down. I used to look forward to those camping trips every year. They were the highlight of my summers. So I suppose it is ironic that one of those camping trips will come to haunt me for the rest of my adult life. The final trip to Big Bear we ever made as a family. The one where my little brother disappeared without a trace. It was the 4th of July, 1991, another roasting California summer. Since we had arrived earlier that morning, my dad and uncle had long since set up the grill and were making friendly with some of the other campers, while 10-year-old me and 6-year-old Jacob played with a group of their kids. I remember two of their moms going off to pee or something, since the only public bathrooms were down on the shore back then, and a group of us kids decided we would subject them to a playful kind of ambush. So we found ourselves a few hiding places along the rough trail the moms would be heading back on and prepared to strike. The two women must have spotted a poorly hidden gaggle of giggling children from a mile off, but they're sweet enough to feign a surprise when we all jump out at them. For a few moments, I felt ten feet tall, like a pint-sized green beret or something, and I looked around for Jake so we could celebrate our victory over the Amazonian enemy. But Jake was nowhere to be seen. Last I saw of him, he was running up the trail, trying to find a suitable hiding spot. So I wandered through the shrubs for a while, calling out his name here and there. But again, nothing. I figured he'd wandered back to the campground, but when I did the same, there was still no sign of Jake, and I remember asking my dad and uncle if they had seen him. To think it all started with such a casual, nonchalant question. It all seems so surreal to me now. What followed was a long, slow buildup of tension, a mild concern that twisted and blackened into abject panic and crushing fear. At first, it was just me and my Uncle Ralph walking through the woods, calling out Jake's name. Then, we were asking the other kids if they had seen him. Then it was almost every other adult fanning out around the pine-thick hillsides while my dad called the cops. By the time the sun was starting to set, the campground was teeming with cops and forest rangers who took turns questioning people as they gradually turned the place into a kind of makeshift headquarters. I must have told the same story to a dozen different uninformed and plain-clothed officials from a variety of divisions and departments, and by the time I gave a statement to two plain-clothed state police detectives, I actually felt detached from what was happening. I don't think I quite understood the implications. Like, I remember just wanting Jake to stop hiding and come out so we could all just go home, you know? I remember the cops telling my dad that he should just go home and rest, and that they would be in touch as soon as they had any information. But he wouldn't leave, and I watched as my uncle had to practically drag him back to his car before we all finally drove home. 
like I said, I just wanted this all to end. And as I fell asleep that night to the sound of my mother's desperate sobs, I wondered how long it would take before Jake was going to come back safely. But Jake wasn't coming home, and it took a two-week-long search and rescue operation that spanned the entire San Bernardino National Forest for us to realize this. After that, my family started to slowly fall apart. Mom kept it together for a while. She didn't blame Dad at first, but not out loud anyway. After the second round of police visits, she wasn't shy about letting him know whose fault she thought this was. By that time, my dad had started drinking pretty heavily, constantly hearing about what a crappy father he was and how he should have been keeping an eye on his son. He just fell off entirely. Then one day, I came home from school, and his car wasn't in the driveway. He couldn't handle it anymore. He'd gone to live with my uncle over in Vernon. But what could have possibly prompted such a change in behavior from my mom? What could those two state police detectives have told my parents that had them hating each other so much? It took me years to find out, but being a little older didn't make it any less terrifying. About three or four months after the search for Jake's body was called off, police got a call from one of the other campers who had been at Deer Group Campground that day. Apparently, this person had left something out of their witness statement that they believed might be pertinent to the investigation. A short while before my dad alerted the other campers that my brother was missing, the person had been walking from the lakeside when he'd seen someone moving through the woods away from the direction of the campground. Given that they were moving through some quite dense pine forest while facing away from them, the caller couldn't give much of a description. But they did say that the person had some kind of yellow cloth over their shoulder. Some uh, astute detective then double-checked the description of what Jake was wearing that day. And, as I can testify, I found that my brother had been wearing a canary yellow t-shirt on the day he went missing. It wasn't a sack on the person's back. It was my little brother. Yet, despite such a compelling lead, the police never really took the caller seriously. The commonly accepted theory is that Jake wandered off into the woods trying to find a hiding spot, then was spotted, stalked, and taken by some kind of animal, be it a black bear, a cougar, or possibly even a coyote. Even in the face of the park rangers failing to find any kinds of remains, as well as the call from the latecomer witness, the official stance did not change. But when I found out exactly what the guy had said, I started to understand why his statement had come into such dispute among law enforcement. After explaining that he thought he had seen a figure walking away from the campgrounds, carrying that bright yellow colored sack, he attempted to give the police some rough idea of who they were looking for. It was just over 20 years after the incident, shortly after Jake was declared legally deceased, that I finally managed to talk to the detective who took this guy's statement. But he remembered every word of what had been said. At first, it had been a witness statement much like any other, but soon this detective was shooting his partner incredulous looks, as their witness statement was turning into something unusual. Naturally, since he hadn't been facing them, the witness couldn't describe the figure's face, but he was able to note the person's dark hair and that they wore similarly dark clothing, including what looked to be some kind of winter jacket. Winter jacket? In the middle of California summer? Do the math on that one real quick. So, that's where the statement starts to get a little weird. But then the next thing is the positioning and the timing of the sighting. The cop could not remember the exact math that was done to work this out, but he said if this mystery figure really did have my brother over his shoulder to be in the position to be sighted at this particular time, he would have been jogging or have the giant strides of someone maybe eight or nine feet tall. Which is ridiculous, right? A nine foot tall kidnapper, really, running up and down hills under the baking burdew sunshine in a winter coat with a six year old boy on his shoulder? You start putting it together, and either my brother was taken by a cougar, partially eaten, or had his remains buried for later, or he was kidnapped by a world-class but very inappropriately dressed athlete. And suddenly, the conclusion just seems a little clearer. But that's only if you discount a few other crucial details of the guy's witness statement. Because as the detective was quick to inform me, 
This witness did actually describe the figure as being abnormally tall, how the piece of cloth didn't even cover their entire shoulder as they lumbered, seemingly exhausted through the pines. But the thing that gets to me is how the witness said at one point, the figure stopped, turned, and looked right at them, and that even from that distance, he could tell that there was something horribly, horribly wrong with the figure's face. I was sitting face to face with the guy when he told me that, in a bar in Fayetteville, Arkansas, 20 years after Jake went missing. You think an ex-cop wouldn't be able to say such a thing without laughing, or at least shake their head about how dumb it sounded, but he sounded haunted by it, like a part of him actually believed it. And it's at that moment that I realized I was going to have to unlearn everything I thought I knew about Jake's disappearance. It took another couple of years before I realized I could actually do something. That it wasn't just cops or private eyes that could investigate a person's disappearance. But by that time, my dad had passed and my mom was living in some religious commune out in Salt Lake City or something. All the cops that had worked the case had retired or moved up the ladder, and my uncle was dying of stage 3 lung cancer. I knew how to get hold of my mom, and was actually able to get her on the phone. The group she's with is weird but not unfriendly. But as soon as I mentioned Jacob's name, she hung up. I get it though. She spent 25 years getting over it. I understand exactly why she does not want to go waking snakes. Next stop was my Uncle Ralph's place over in Vernon. He had this sweet, older Mexican lady living with him who made sure he had his pain meds, but he still wasn't doing too good. I hated seeing him in that grim, dusty, chemical-stinking hellscape. But as he put it, he worked there all his life. He'd die there too. Ralph leveled with me. He'd always been against my mom and dad's idea of just accepting that Jake was gone. He said he understood my mom's idea that the false hope would just consume them, but reminded me that acceptance hadn't been easier on my father and his alcohol-related death, or my mom and her goddamn doomsday cult friends, his words, not mine, Needless to say, he approved of my proposition to search for answers regarding Jake's disappearance. But he did have a caveat. He said the point wasn't so much to find anything. The search would be its own reward. I'd be able to reassure myself that I'd at least tried to do something, and that might just prevent me from losing my mind or drinking myself to death. And so it came to pass for the first time in 24 years, I made that faithful journey up into the hills around San Bernardino, to the last place I saw my little brother alive, Big Bear Lake. When I say it was not easy, I mean that in every possible way. Emotionally, it was tough, but getting the time off of work and driving down from Oregon was a real son of a bee. But I had my plan laid out, and I was sticking to it. I'd hike around Big Bear every day for a week and just sort of see what I could turn up. I know that seems like a dumb plan, but my uncle said it wasn't so much about finding Jake, but rather finding a way to secure my own sanity. I had booked myself six nights at the Bear Creek Resort. Not the fanciest place, but it's a location near the southern trailhead, and it made it preferable to any of the other extravagant hotels. Besides, what I was about to do was about as far removed from a vacation as I could possibly imagine. The first day's hiking felt like opening up an old wound. My mood sank lower and lower as I walked towards the trails, towards Deer Group Campground, and by the time I actually laid eyes on the place, I felt like a scared little boy again. It was heavily overgrown and completely deserted, but the way the ground flattened out a little, the way the trees were positioned, I recognized it instantly. I could make out almost the exact spot where we had camped that 4th of July. The trail that me and Jake walked off on, places the cops had parked their four-wheel drives to shine flashlights onto maps splayed across their hoods. I don't believe in ghosts, but after seeing that old campground, I believe a place can be haunted. Not by evil spirits or poltergeists or anything like that, but by bad memories, specters in the mind. I fought back tears as I walked the overgrown trail we hit on, then felt a little rush of fear as I realized I was walking the exact same patch of dirt that Jake had just before he went missing. 
Like I said, that first day was the toughest, but things did not get easier as the week went by. I kept hiking the trails south of the lake, slowly refamiliarizing myself with the area, just keeping my eyes out for anything of interest. But as you can imagine, that didn't amount to much, and although those first few days in Big Bear were deeply cathartic, I was no closer to finding what happened to Jake. By the Saturday, my second to last day in Big Bear, I was content to drive back to Eugene no more enlightened than I had been previously. I had had almost an entire week to reflect on what happened or did not happen to Jake, and somehow, being closer to home, to where it all happened in the first place, gave me a deeper feeling of closure, and I can't tell you how good that felt. I should have known I'd find a way to spoil that for myself, because at one point, as I'm walking through the woods about two or three miles east of Deer Group Campground, I catch my foot on something and end up face down in the dirt, completely winded. I fell so hard I thought I might have cracked something, and as I got up and dusted myself off, I turned to see what I had tripped over. I had kicked away some dirt and pine needles to get a good look at it, and lo and behold, at the base of this small rocky shelf jutting out of the soil, was an opening in the ground. It was maybe only about a foot wide, and turned out to be only slightly wider than my phone, and I'm sure you can imagine how I figured that out. Out of all the things I have heard or read about the search and rescue operation following Jake's disappearance, I'd never heard anything about any caves under Big Bear, and in all the rambling I'd done over the previous days, I hadn't seen one single cave entrance on any of the hillsides and neither did Big Bear's website advertise any kind of caving activities, and you can bet your ass that that's an angle I covered before I drove down here. Anyway, the phone thing. At first, I shined my phone's flashlight into the fissure, which is how I determined that it was rather deep into the earth. Then, since my phone case has a little wrist loop which stops me from dropping it, I was able to tie my headphones to it before carefully lowering my phone into the aperture of the earth. And since I did this while a video was recording, I figured I might be able to get an idea of how deep or large the cave was. I give it a good minute, making sure I twist and turn the headphone wire so to get as much as a 360 recording of whatever was down there. But when I pull the phone back up and play the video back, I don't see a thing. I can see where the flashlight is illuminating and the immediate darkness in front of the camera but the light isn't bouncing back off of any cave floors or walls. I'm no geologist, but I don't think you need a college degree to work out that there's a huge damn cave system in the Burdu National Forest, and one that seems to have been previously undiscovered. I spent the remainder of that day trying to find an entrance to such a cave system, and had no luck whatsoever. The following day, I had this dull ache in my elbow and ribs where I'd fallen. So after a quick visit to the Bear Valley Community Hospital, where I was assured that it was nothing but some heavy bruising, I decided to give the San Burdu National Forest HQ a call to inquire about the cave system I inadvertently discovered. Even though I would not seen or heard anything about caves around Big Bear, I was still surprised to hear that not a single park ranger had ever come across any kind of subterranean passage during all of their years rambling around the forest. When asked why I asked about such a thing, I explained to a friendly park ranger by the name of Mike Garza that it involved a missing persons case from two decades prior, and after that he seemed even more willing to help out than he was before. He said he'd make his own inquiries before heading up to the area I'd specified, and that he'd call me back during the following week or so to let me know if he had found anything. Again, I was almost certain the cops would have covered such an angle in their initial investigations but still it could not hurt to try, right? Well, a week goes by, and I've yet to hear back from Ranger Mike regarding the cave system. I figure he's just busy or something, so I don't take it personally. Only, when I called to check if he had made any progress, I was told that Mike wasn't stationed with the San Bernardino team anymore, and that he had handed in his resignation just a few days before. That seemed incredibly sudden and I asked the person who answered what prompted such a sudden departure. The guy had no idea, but when I mentioned that I'd spoken to Mike regarding a previously undiscovered cave system, there was a long and pregnant pause. 
The guy then told me that Mike had mentioned something like that in his final week on the job, and that one day, when he had returned from a longer than usual patrol, he seemed... different. When I asked him to clarify exactly what he meant, the guy said Mike seemed anxious to the point of paranoia, refused to talk about what was bothering him, then announced he would be quitting a few days later. He cleared out his desk, emptied his locker, and that was the last day they had seen him down at the Burdu Ranger HQ. I've tried to get some contact details for Mike Garza, but as one former colleague of his said, Mike just about dropped off the face of the earth after he quit. I've got many, many questions surrounding what happened to Mike after he left the Forest Service, with the main one being, what the hell did he see or do after we spoke that left him so freaked out? And whatever it was, could it possibly be connected to my little brother's disappearance? Jake's apparent abduction is something I've been privately investigating for years now, but apparently I've hit some kind of brick wall. And until I find out what happened to Mike Garza, I don't think I'll ever get anything in the way of definitive answers. But as I said, this is something I'm continually working on. And in light of what I've discovered, it's not something I'll be giving up on anytime soon. I hope you have found what I wrote to be of interest, considering the content of your channel. And if you'd like to hear any updates regarding my investigation, please let me know, as I won't hesitate to inform you of any updates. I hope to hear from you soon. Yours truly, Ray Duwall. Hi Swamp. First of all, I'd just like to say a huge thank you for reading my email. I didn't imagine for a second that you'd actually read it on your channel, and I'm forever in your debt for giving Jake's case that much more exposure. But as you can imagine, it was also quite bittersweet, and although I appreciate all the kind words from your viewers, it only reminds me that there's so much more to be done in search for the truth. Secondly, I want to apologize for taking so long to get this follow-up over to you. It's been difficult to type up, even harder than the first email, especially in light of more recent discoveries. And thirdly, I feel like there are a few issues that commenters raise that are definitely worth addressing. Probably the most important is the fact that Jake's disappearance bears a remarkable resemblance to that of the six-year-old Dennis Martin, who disappeared in the Great Smoky Mountains during June of 1969. Believe me when I say that I find the many similarities to be nothing short of chilling, and I still believe there is a link between the two disappearances, no matter how small it may be. What's more, given the young Dennis's disappearance, it's been connected to many others that have occurred in the U.S. National Parks. It's entirely possible that Jake is a part of a wider network as well. In fact, that's the main theory. I've been working on for quite some time now. You see, for those who don't know, I actually sent my original email over to Swamp in the fall of 2018. And since then, I've had plenty of time to gather additional information that was not included in my original email. But instead of finding answers that provided any sense of comfort or closure, what I discovered had some pretty terrifying implications. The first involves the park ranger that seemed to drop off the face of the earth after I talked to him. If you remember, I asked a ranger named Mike Garza to investigate a previously undiscovered cave system in hills surrounding Big Bear Lake. He said he'd get back to me as soon as he could, but not only did I never hear from him again, he quit the National Park Service, leaving no contact details behind for me to get in touch with him. Right about the time we left off, so probably October of 2018, I had a big hunch that Mike's bizarre and sudden departure from the park service was somehow connected to my brother's disappearance. Luckily, park rangers both past and present were only too happy to assist me once they learned who I was and what I was trying to do. It took me a while to find someone who had gotten to know Mike personally whilst working with him, but again, they were only too happy to talk to me. I discovered that Mike had talked about having a brother in a little town called Maxwell up in Northern California. I didn't have a number or an address for him, but since Maxwell was a small farming community, I figured at least someone up there would know a guy named Garza. Like I mentioned, I currently live in Eugene, Oregon, so I had to wait until the weekend to make the six hour drive down to NorCal. When I rolled into Maxwell, it looked almost exactly like I imagined it. It was a farming land for sure, 
flat as a pancake for miles in every direction. Having grown up living around hills and mountains all my life, being somewhere with so much sky gave this weird kind of vulnerable feeling. One, which was vindicated when I later learned that Maxwell was subject to some pretty hardcore flooding each year. After I cruised through the town for a couple of blocks, I spotted what appeared to be a local bar. It was a hole in the wall saloon type place called the Foxhole. And I figured it would be as good a place as any to start coaxing information from the locals. Having only just opened in the previous half hour, the Foxhole wasn't exactly at peak trading hours. But the bartender was friendly enough for me to engage in a little light conversation as I nursed a glass bottle of coke. When he seemed happy enough with my story that I was just passing through on my way to Sacramento, I casually dropped Mike Garza's name into the exchange. I told him that Mike was an old high school buddy, and that I heard that he had a brother out near Maxwell. I honestly expected the bartender to shrug it off. Hell, Mike's brother might have never even visited the foxhole. That's even if he still lived here at all. But as soon as the name Garza left my lips, it was like the guy just glitched on the spot. He stopped wiping down the bar top, but just carried on staring at it like it would magically start drying itself or something. That's the moment I knew I had something. I just had no idea how big it would be. The bartender asked me again how I know Mike, and I repeated the lie that we were high school friends. Only, I didn't have to feign my surprise at what he told me next. He said that, although he hated having to be the bearer of bad news, Mike Garza had passed away just over a year ago. What hit me next was a mix of sadness, disappointment, and shame. Sadness for Mike Garza and his family, disappointment that I'd driven all the way down to Maxwell for nothing, and shame that I seemed to view the man as nothing more than an asset, just a means to an end. I'd go back to Eugene empty-handed, but Mike... Mike had lost everything. I could have just left it right there, thanked the guy, walked out the foxhole, and my story would have ended there. But I didn't. I asked how Mike died, and the answer the bartender gave me changed absolutely everything. In the moments after I asked, the bartender kind of shuffled awkwardly before shooting the bar flies a look, like he was silently seeking their permission to reveal some deep, personal secret. And in a way, I suppose he was. The whole time his speech was just start, stop, start, stop. Like the words just wouldn't come out. But over the course of a minute or so, the bartender tells me that Mike had taken his own life. I was just stunned. The situation had taken an even darker turn than it already had. And on top of that, the bartender then added how it was complicated. And that Gabe, that's Mike's brother, has a lot to say about it. He then cut himself off like he was talking out of turn. I didn't press him. My heart was pounding in my chest with my brain screaming out, find his freaking brother, ask him where his brother is. But I just had this feeling like, I don't know, it's hard to describe, almost like a predator or something. Like I've been stalking some deer for hours and I'm so, so close to catching it. Only one wrong move and it's gone forever. I knew I had to be patient. I was so close to finding something, I just had to play dumb and non-threatening for a little while longer. It was obviously a sensitive situation, and no one would be talking unless they actually wanted to. I was playing a kind of game, I get that, stirring up bad memories for selfish reasons, and I admit that the next thing I did was designed to win over the bar's occupants just a little bit more. But at the same time, I did a pang of grief for a man I barely knew. When I bought everyone around and we raised our glasses to Mike Garza. Over the next hour or so, I managed to glean that Mike's brother Gabe Garza worked as a mechanic around town. At least when he wasn't sleeping off a drinking escapade. He spent most evenings in the foxhole, propping up the bar just feet away from where I was sat. And if I came back later that night, there was a good chance I'd be able to talk to him myself. That's if I got there before he sank to the bottom of a bottle. The bartender was nice enough to take my cell phone number, telling me he'd call me if Mike's brother showed up. After all, he was under the impression that all I wanted to do was give Gabe Garza my condolences, not go digging around where I arguably didn't belong. 
I had to drive about 15 minutes south to a place called Williams, where there was a Motel 6 that I could check into, just in case I had to stay overnight. And after getting some shockingly good tacos from a small truck on E Street, it was where I waited for the bartender's call. It was not until around 9.30pm that the bartender called, telling me that Gabe just rolled into the bar. I grabbed my keys, ran out to my car, and may or may not have broken the speed limit until I got to the foxhole. When I walked inside, the place was barely any livelier than it had been a few hours previous. Only I noticed the distinct addition of a large man with black hair and a blue hoodie, propped up on a bar stool just where I was told he'd be. I walked up, and the bartender introduces me as a high school friend of Mike's to a 40-something Latino guy with these tired, sad eyes. I tried my best to gloss over exactly how me and Mike knew each other, instead focusing on paying my respects to a grieving brother. At first, he just thanked me, shaking my hand and accepting my offer to buy him a beer. I sat down with him and told him how shocked and saddened I'd been to hear the news, and he continued to show appreciation for the sentiment. But then after a few beers, I told him that Mike didn't strike me as the kind of guy to kill himself. Because he didn't, came Gabe's response. It was so quick and so matter of fact that I almost spat my beer out all over the bar top. I asked him what he meant by that, and he replied with something like, Exactly what I goddamn said. Mike didn't kill himself. He was murdered. I'd swear my jaw just about hit the floor at that point. The same guy I'd asked to look for the caves had quit his job and taken his own life within a year. Just what the hell was going on here? Then, totally unprompted, Gabe started talking about the local paper and how the cops in the corner had all conspired to make this look like a suicide. According to him, the first medical examiner's report came back saying that Mike had been murdered since a handful of the 26 stab wounds he'd received were so deep into his shoulder and neck that they simply could not have been inflicted by himself. Yet shortly afterward, this medical examiner was fired, and all of his recent reports had to be corroborated by incoming personnel. The new medical examiner then re-examines Mike's body, and declares that since the stab wounds had been inflicted with Knife's own pen knife, and that since Mike was apparently suffering from depression around the same time, that it had to be a suicide. Gabe is telling me all of this at a mile a minute. It was the first time I'd seen him look awake and animated all night, but once he gets into such a frenzy, that the bartender catches on to what he's talking about, and comes over saying, Not this again, Gabe. Don't do this. Don't do this to yourself. As he and the bartender begin to argue amongst themselves, what struck me as interesting was that this was obviously something that Gabe had talked about a lot over the previous year, to the point that it had started to sound almost like a conspiracy theory to those who had heard the story a hundred times. Only, it wasn't like he was talking about flat earth theories or goddamn lizard people or something. It sounded like he had a legit complaint involving some kind of incompetency with the medical examiner. It was the kind of thing that the LA Times reporters would normally be all over like a rash. But as Gabe said himself, Nobody wanted to listen. Nobody wanted to know. By about midnight, I was exhausted, and Gabe was toast. My conversation would be better conducted in the light of day, with sober minds. So I swapped cell phone numbers with him, told him I'd be in touch about Mike's death, then drove back to the Motel 6 in Williams to get some sleep. I'll never forget the nightmare I had in that motel bed. I don't know if it was the beer I had. I hardly touch a drop these days or all the stress of discovering Mike's death, but I had a dream where I couldn't scream because my mouth was covered in duct tape, and someone held my fingers around the grip of a handgun before putting it to my head and pulling the trigger. Naturally, I felt like crap the next morning as I grabbed a coffee from a nearby Starbucks and began my journey northward back to Oregon. But on my way, I decided to roll through Maxwell one last time. I had a feeling I'd be back for a face-to-face -face with Gabe Garza at some point, but before I left, I figured I'd stop by Maxwell Cemetery and pay my respects to Mike. Like I mentioned, I felt like I was using him for my own personal gain, and I didn't really, didn't really want that weighing on my mind. Having known exactly what it's like to lose a sibling before their time, the whole thing just didn't sit right with me. It took me a while to find the right plot, but I did eventually, and I stood there for a few moments with my head bowed, 
wondering if there was a slim chance that Mike's death might somehow be down to me. Then as I'm driving back to Oregon, when I just possibly can't think things get any weirder, I have a rather frightening encounter with a black Ford F-150. It appeared behind me about 20 miles or so from the state line, and I took no notice of the thing until it grew larger and larger in my rear view. I figured they'd just go around, but after a minute or so of tailing me when I'm making these go-round gestures, I realize they're not going anywhere. This jet black truck with a tinted windshield, which I'm almost certain is illegal in California, tails me right into Oregon state lines, and at one point it was so close to my rear bumper that I had to put my foot down and give the guy a warning honk. The message was clear but I wasn't about to let this guy run me off the road, and thankfully he backed off before there was a major accident. I appreciate that the encounter might have been nothing but a dumb coincidence, that I just so happened to irritate some neurotic gas guzzler, but I'm telling you, I knew it had something to do with me talking to Gabe Garza. I can't prove it. I just... I just feel it, and I know that sounds crazy, but given enough time, I think I can prove it. I ended up taping an actual sit-down between Gabe and myself, and I'll get to work writing and getting transcripts sent over to you, so you can see what he has to say about Mike's suicide. I can promise you, they're very, very interesting, but this is long enough already, and I don't want to drown you in a wall of text, or make your listeners wait any longer for an update. Again, I really can't thank you guys enough for helping me bring more attention to Jake's case, and I'll be in touch soon with my next update. And to all those going through similar situations, to all those searching for a missing loved one, don't give up. Although the truth might seem scary, we owe it to the ones we've lost to bring their fate to light. And if I can find out what happened to my little brother, maybe, just maybe, I'll be able to find out who or what took him from me. Thanks for listening to these creepy and downright strange in the woods horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button so it really feels it. Subscribe to The Swamp if you are new. Be sure you turn on notifications so you don't miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day in all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your stories at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go and still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story was your favorite tonight. It helps me pick better ones in the future, and I always love to see which ones you guys are enjoying. If you made it to the very end, the code word for today is blue font, F-O-N-T, blue font. Be sure to comment that down below if you made it to the end. Confuse anybody else who didn't, and anybody who makes the funniest comment will be pinned at the top. Thank you guys so much for supporting the swamp the way you do, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.